My name is Dave Kang. I'm the director of the Korean Studies Institute and a professor here at USC. And the Korean Studies Institute focuses on contemporary politics and business and things like that. And particularly, uh, someone like Roy is fascinating because he's Korean American, it's business, it's all the kinds of things that we at USC and the Korean Studies Institute want to try and promote and study and understand. Uh, so we're delighted to have him here. Uh, and in fact, we had him in 2009, no, yeah, 2009, right? Right after they started, and it was so fascinating. So we're delighted that he can come back now in 2012 uh, because it's a, a, an amazing opportunity, it's an amazing story. So what I thought we would do is, briefly, you know the story of Roy, but we'll talk for 20 or 30 minutes, Roy and I will just chat, uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for everyone because it's, it's an amazing story and we wanna make sure that all of you guys get involved particularly students get involved. Uh, so uh, why don't we first join me in welcoming Roy for, for taking time out and coming here. Um, and, I, and I thought we'd start, if you can tell us a little bit about, you're born in Korea, but you moved to America at an early age. Yeah. And just a little bit about like your family and what it was like to grow up and where, because I know it's sort of K-Town and stuff like that, but a little bit about how you got okay. started. Um, it's like every, but just to break the ice, if you notice in the pictures, um, to, um, this is the East a Asian studies group, like Asian, Asian people when they take pictures, they go, <laughs> <laughs> and when the white people take pictures, they go like, yeah, you know, <laughs> so, but in any case, um, uh, yeah, I was born in Korea, man, like, just like uh, probably some of you and uh, a lot of immigrant children, I think we're still working through that, that cycle of where, um, you know, even uh, people in their 40s, 30s, 20s, are still, a lot of them, we still have a good percentage that are born and then immigrate over. I came over early uh, when I was two, just before I was two, and I came at a time where there was no Koreatown. Um, and it was a time where there weren't that many Korean immigrants. There were only probably like 240,000 total Asians in Los Angeles, and we were clumped into one category. Um, if you guys know, the Federal Immigration Act was made 65, I believe, right? And um, that was where they allowed us to actually come back, you know, come into the country. Before that, a lot of the Koreans that were coming through in the first wave were, um, and my parents were one of them, were mostly educated in, in the sense that they were here on student visas. And uh, there weren't really um, any immigrants coming in that were just, you know, fleeing the country or just coming in and visiting their uncle because there was no uncle to visit, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, that's how we got here. My, my pops, he started out on the East Coast and eventually ended up at UCLA. And, um, and then, you know, we, we started Koreatown, uh, Westmoreland and Olympic. What did he do? Uh, you know, it's the typical Asian story, man. That motherfucker is educated all the way to the 10th degree. And we ran liquor stores and video shops. Like, all his friends, too, man. Like, every, everywhere I grew up, um, like every uncle and you know non-blood uncle that I grew up around, you know they all study like literature, philosophy, political science, diplomatic studies, medicine, engineering, you know all these things. And then they ran video shops, one-hour photo shops, and so like you had all these merchant stores with like um, extremely educated people that were, you know, that went through their own battles. But on the serious side of it, that first wave, I think um, they had to. Uh, travel through their own cobwebs of um, like had built this life, this educated life and all of a sudden um, all of those dreams no longer existed because you had to survive. And so um, who gets the grunt of all of that? Us kids. <laughs> you know, so we studying, you know, doing sixth grade math when you're in first grade and all that stuff. But uh, um, that was, yeah. I, but the, the unique thing about my life and I can continue to progress on it is that I didn't just grow up in, in one neighborhood. I moved around a lot. And uh, I was very fortunate that I was able to see every different economic, um, I guess, strata, every economic strata throughout my life, from struggling at the beginning, um, also struggling again towards the middle when some of our businesses went bankrupt, uh, bouncing around Koreatown, West LA, West Hollywood, Crenshaw, and then I moved like almost 10 times, and then up through wow. Norwalk, Anaheim, Fountain Valley, Garden Grove, um, uh, City of Orange, and then down south to Mission Viejo. But the wow. thing, the, 
I guess what I've been thinking about it a lot is like these last three years have transpired. I think that's what really gives me the strength and the insight to be able to cook for so many people um, on such a wide scale because my whole life has been such a wide scale where uh, I went to a really affluent high school and I went to a really poor elementary school. And, um, and so I've, I've seen it, you know, I've, I've been in like so many different circumstances. I can feel those rhythms and kind of those, the different cultures and different appetites. So, um, but I started in Koreatown. I got Olympic Boulevard on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> so Kate, Koreatown is where you really feel like that's your, your yeah, center? Yeah, but, but I was, the, the thing about Koreatown, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that we were a part of Koreatown at a time where it wasn't, before it, it was Koreatown. Before it was Koreatown. Yeah. And so looking back on it, it's really, um, it's really amazing to see how it grew. And it grew, um, you know, there weren't even, there was only one Korean market. I mean, some of this stuff might blow your mind, but there was only one Korean market, and it was on Hobart and Olympic. And it was in the brick building that currently houses the Western Union. Um, there was one medical office, which is the one right across from um, uh, uh, Chosun Kalbi uh, on Olympic and Manhattan. Um, you know, and then th there was Dong Yiljang that opened up, I think, in the early 80s or late 70s. And there were a couple other little shops here and there, but you know, pretty much you had to like to 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 go back and reminisce on flavors. And even before that, my parents came in the in the mid '60s to get those flavors and those those things inside of your stomach as far as food goes. You had to take American ingredients and kind of like mash them up and manipulate them, you know. So like we would take sauerkraut and Tabasco, and then that would become kimchi. You know, um, you know what I'm saying? Oh. and then like, and then like, uh, sundubu is like an LA food, right? It's not a Korean food. You all know that, right? If you don't, you don't know. No, I didn't know. You that. Know? Um, that you know that came from just getting tofu and then getting the ingredients that were available and then mashing them up. Really? Yeah. You know, sundubu is not Korean. You know, and I, I think sundubu is a big reflection of like ourselves and my life. Who didn't you know? know that? Right? I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so like. And that's the, I think that's the beauty of how you know, we've evolved as Korean Americans is like, I look at, I look at me as like a pot of sundu, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but, like, um, the, but the main thing is like to see the city evolve. It evolved, and on the intricate network, it evolved. Um, I mean, I see some, some older generation here, I'm sure you guys know, uh, evolved through a lot of uh, care meetings, right? And a lot of internal networking and, um, really supporting each other, and uh, not only financially, but emotionally, and um, from a community level. And just doing like, it was like an ant farm. I look at it like an ant farm, you know what I mean? Like, you know, no one really paid attention to us except for ourselves, and it looked like, you know, we're just a, because we were the ones dishwashing at the time, you know what I mean? And like, I work around, um, my whole life has been surrounded by Latino culture, my whole life. And you know, when I see people just like disregard Latino culture, like that is a brown person, or that you know that person is just working. Um, but I know I know the person that that person's pointing at on a human level. You know what I mean? And so that's that's the same thing with like the Korean community back then. It's like they were looking at us in a certain way, and while that was coming at us, we were just building you know the yeah. foundation and um, really sharing the money and building stores and, and going into an area that people were afraid to go into, which was mainly South Central and, you know, Lower Hollywood and, yeah. you know, Koreatown. So, um, but we were talking about my life. Well, no, Koreatown. that's fine, because this, this in, in a way, we'll just, we'll just follow the conversation, because yeah. in a way, your, your food that came out now, actually, if, like with the Sundubu example, is, mm -hmm. is a much more organic type of... I think so food that then I would have thought, which is you didn't sit around in the abstract saying, let's do this. It, you just grew up with putting yeah. stuff together in Latino culture. Tell us, tell us. And I think that's where um, the power of, of if, we're, if we can keep food as like the anchor to this whole conversation, that's where the power of, I mean, that Sundu was one of the strongest elements of Koreatown, I think, as far as like what people eat and the translation of our town to maybe people coming in and trying Korean food for the first time, um, you know, like, I think if you try to force it, I, I tried to force Korean food for a long time into, into a chef model, 
and it never worked. And what I, the wall that I finally hit, kept hitting, I realized that Korean food is not Western food. So if it's just fundamentally not Western, if it's fundamentally not put and can, and can be delivered, not even understood, if it can't be delivered in the format that is structured here in America, then how can I even translate it in that form? You mean like in a nice restaurant with linen? On the plate, linen on the plate, because everything, in most cases, in, in, in the way we eat as Americans or even Europeans, uh, we eat food on one plate. Whereas um, in most Asian cultures, you don't eat food on one plate. You share central food that becomes yeah, a, mal- uh, yeah. a collage on your plate. And um, so, you know, that's, I think, where the taco became, became organic, is that um, I no longer try to force translating Korean food and making it, you know, uh, understood, and just let it be, you know, and just let it be in the format that it had to be. And that's when it blew up, you know. And it's only three years old now, but Sundubu is maybe, you know, 40 years old. You know, we can imagine maybe, you know, 20 years, you know, yeah. it'll be like Sindhu. You know? <laughs> you'll never, you'll never Kogi know. tacos. Yeah, you'll never know it was from L.A., you know. You'll well, think it's Korean or you'll <laughs> think it's from Mexico, you know. <laughs> Tell us more then. So, so you grew up all around K-Town, Crenshaw, everything else. And then the, the other part of your story that I know is that you went to uh, a certain college. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Right. So, so you went for a long time. You were still trying to do what we might consol- uh, call a more traditional Korean American path. Well, like you know that that's um, like I I've had a struggle my whole life, and the thing is, it wasn't because I was trying to rebel or that I was a bad person or a bad kid. Um, it's just there weren't many options for me. You know. So. To, to try to fit in to, you know, I did what was just laid out in front of me, which was go to school, take SATs, apply for college, go to college, graduate, go to grad school, go to law school, and then finally, you know, I hit a wall in, after the first year of law school. But in between all of that, man, you know, it was a volcano inside of me every single day, you know, and, um, you know, I didn't know how to fit it in or, or I always felt out of place. And I always felt like there was, there was no avenue for me to express myself. And, um, and anything that I did enjoy or thought was really special to me would just get put down right away. And um, so I kept those things very private to me. But the thing about Kogi now is all of the things that make Kogi so special are the exact same things I was doing when I was in high school, which is um, uh, I wasn't studying that much. I was <laughs> hanging out on the street. Uh, just chilling, you know, sh- sharing food with people, um, jumping in cars, just hanging out, watching the sunset, um, you know, uh, sharing a cigarette with someone that asked for it, you know, giving a light to somebody, um, you know, helping hand, you know, um, and the, those are all of the elements of Kogi, and those are all the elements that kind of come out when you're out on the streets, is um, just kind of like really letting down your guard in a way and, and sharing. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing with the, the biggest thing that's been happening lately, and I don't know if this will relate to some of you, um, but I've, been, I've, been, I've reached a point where I've really, I've, I've made peace with my, my own, like, non-Koreanness, in a way. And it took a long time, man. This, this like, guilt took, like, you know, a long time, like three decades, you know. <laughs> so I'm hoping youngsters have a, a sh- shorter period. But like, finally coming to terms with it and then letting it go and then like not being afraid or ashamed or anything and expressing myself not worrying about being Korean. And then the moment I started doing that all the way, everything became even more Korean, you know. And then it started to become my own expression and it blossomed in its own way. It almost like grew a tumor. And then it turned into its own version of being Korean, um, which is Kogi, you know. And um, and then through that, it I think it really translated a lot of things about about Korea. You know, it made Korean food really exciting. I mean, even just recent times, back in the '90s and, and like early 2000s, 
ain't nobody non-Koreans coming to Koreatown. You know, right now it's like cool to go to Koreatown, and you know, like everybody's got a food blog, and you know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's not even adventurous anymore to go to Koreatown. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we've already gotten past that stage. There was a point where it was like adventurous to pass Western, and it's not even adventurous anymore. Like, but then I remember a time where it wasn't. You couldn't even people wouldn't even go past Western. You know, and uh, so like, and then now it's even one step further where. Um, you know, now like, the, you know, kimchi, you know, like if you look at even beyond just my emotional feelings, if you look at facts within my industry, within the food industry, if you look at all of the industry reports and all of the industry uh, publications and um, all of our kind of like data and everything, over the last two and a half years, the number one food trend, flavor, and um, menu development items have been Korean. Really? Yes. They've, they've all been centered around Korean food, Korean cuisine, um, and then branched off into other Asian cuisines. And um, that has held its course for the last uh, three years. And for me, that, that is like, you know, it's remarkable. You know, I, I don't know of any other word, you know, like because, um, you know, to not have to like explain or or defend, or even like um, try to translate, where you just say kimchi or gochujang, or you just say, uh, you know, so you're not apologetic for it. You're not saying, not so apologetic. Yeah, you're not worried yeah, about are you yeah. gonna stink? Is it? Yeah. You're not worried about like, you know, is it okay? Or or you know, like I used to like I used to hate when like people came to restaurants and like it was always like this fucking lecture to just eat. You know, like everything was like. Oh, and this is this, and that's that, and yeah. this is this, and this is this, and this is why we do this, and this is, that, and it's like, um, and now we're at a point where we don't have to do that anymore. It's like, again, for me, it's like truly remarkable, and um, and if that's a first step, then there's a lot more, you know, a lot more beauty ahead of us as far as like Korean American identity. Yeah. You know? And so you, that comes out of. Like, I think it's really interesting. You said once you stopped worrying about being Korean, yeah. then you're able to embrace it more, right? Was that, that must have been more than just I used to have arguments thing, all right? the time yeah. with first generation Koreans. Um, I don't know if they understood me because I was speaking English. <laughs> they, 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 they don't speak Korean, English, but I was arguing, I was still arguing. Um, but I, I was arguing like, you know, how can, how can you ever expect me to be like Korean? I'm not Korean, I'm American, you know, and like, um, so, I always argued that there was a new form of being Korean, like, you know, like you need to embrace us being, being a new extension, just like, you know, Sheila dynasty, Chosen, whatever, you yeah. know, this is a new extension. This is the new kind of dynasty that rolls on. We've moved to another country. We uprooted the root, planted it in a different soil. You can't expect the same results, yeah. you know, and so, um, what did you but it took. <laughs> what did mom and dad think? Uh, well, you know, and again, that's a big part of it too. Yeah. And I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be real, like, is um, not really caring what my mom and think, mom and dad yeah. think, you know. And that took a long time. Uh, I love them to death, you know. But uh, but the moment you know, I got to a point where I really didn't care. You know, I talked to like all of my other friends a lot too. Like, I got this friend uh, named Jude, and we talk about like race relations and, and, and parent relations all the time. And then like, you know, he's like, like his mom trying to score drugs off him. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm worried about whether my mom accepts me or not. You know what I mean? So that, that's like a huge gap between like, you know, parental acceptance. Um, so, so like the thing is uh, for me, um, I reached that point already. I've already broken through that threshold. And, um, and so, um, I don't live under that cloud of worrying whether or not, you know, they're proud of me or, yeah. or not. Like, even if they weren't proud of me, I would still be doing this, you know, yeah. and um, I would still be. They must be proud of you now, though. Yeah, um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, that's yes. good, for, good for them, but I, I, don't, you know, I don't know what it means for no, me. No, I know, but, but you got to the point where it was yeah. like, I've got to do my own thing, right? Was that, was that when you left law school or, what, you know? Because for a while, mm -hmm. you tried to do, like you said, the traditional chef thing. So even that was still almost establishment. And then at some point, you said street food. Well, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in between that. Um, I mean, are you guys even interested? Is that, like, I, I think mean, they are. The thing is, like, I, you know, I, from, from a fundamental standpoint and from a, from a physical standpoint, I tried to do all the right things. 
And, um, you know, I did go to school, but again, I was tortured on the inside. And, uh, you know, I ran away a lot as a kid and I, you know, I did a lot of different things, um, you know. But then I reached a point where things were really dwindling down, all the way down. Um, and, you know, and I'm being serious, there was, there was not many paths left. It was like, you know, uh, death, jail, or, or whoring myself out. You know, like, <laughs> like, those are like the three options left, you know what I mean? And then, so like from there, it, it went to, um, you know, I, like I didn't, you know, there was nothing left for me to give my parents. Yeah. I, I guess that's yeah. the deepest thing. It was, there was nothing left for me to give my parents. So I had to, I had to like stop worrying about that. Yeah. And that's when I found food. And then the moment I found food, then all of that went away and I just really got um, addicted to food. And, um, and it was a perfect um, marriage because I've been very compulsive in my life. And so up until that point, all of the compulsions were kind of like vice compulsions, you know? Um, and so then finally when I found something that wasn't like a vice, it became, you know, it, it was like the perfect, you know, yeah, something union. you could build as opposed something to something I could that was build, yeah, yeah, that was yeah, destructive. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then so from there, it just, it was, everything was like, forget it, see yeah. you, cut all the sandbags, boom, 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 yeah. and just go forward. You know? And totally focused on that. Totally on focused that. on food. Yeah. And not worrying or figuring, trying to figure out whether or not this is Korean food or not Korean food, yeah. or am I a Korean chef or not a Korean chef. It was just about food and learning the foundations, almost like martial arts, learning the foundations of cooking. And, um, and then learning how to hold a knife, learning how to extract flavor and season properly, and um, peel, peel vegetables and break down meats and um, you know, build stocks. Yeah. It was all about that. And then as I grew from there, I tried to, you know, I never touched soy sauce or anything for a long time. I was never trained in Asian food. Um, I was trained in mostly French food. And, uh, and then when I started to go out on my own, I tried to maybe tinker around with, with like Asian, you know, kind of like trying to figure out a new way of doing uh, Korean food, yeah. and that's when I hit that wall. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to put all that panchan on one plate. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did, right? Maybe yeah. I, I want to ask him one more thing, which I think is really interesting, and then let's open it up. I don't want to yeah. monopolize the conversation because it's so interesting, right? Yeah. But we were talking earlier, and I remember when you came two years ago, there's this incredible, and the pictures up there are awesome, right? Because there's a real family feeling yeah. of Kogi. And I, and, and I want you to tell us about that, because it's not Korean, it's not Latino, but it's, it, it's so evident that this is more than just a job that people go to. So yeah. how did you get that? How do you maintain it now that you're, now that you're really huge? Um, now that you're well, massively famous. So. Not even. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, how but do you do that? Yeah. The, you know, you can see the smiles are all genuine, yeah. and they're pure, and they're, um, they're beautiful, and they're, they're people just like you. You know, they are you, you know what I mean? And um, it, really, it really became Los Angeles, you know? Um, if, you know, if we're talking about our own like, mountain to climb as far as like, working through all that, that haze of being Asian American and all that guilt that, that we carry along, LA had that own kind of like, haze as well. You know? like, yeah. We weren't always yeah. the best to each other as, as Angelinos or living in Los Angeles, you know? Like, um, like, you know, we could be next to somebody for hours and never even say hello, you know what I mean? Like, you could spend your whole life from apartment to car, and there was a time in L.A. where things were not um, really coming together all the way. And um, I think Kogi, in a way, kind of, it didn't mean to, but it just, there's something about, there was the magic, there was a, a few ma magical elements. There was, it, it, you know, it happened at nighttime, at midnight, you know, and midnight is always a great like witching hour for anything, right? So it happened at midnight. It happened um, with soy sauce and lime juice, which are two really powerful kind of um, sensory and, and, and like food uh, experiences. You know, it happened with um, a desperation where again I had lost, and the people I opened the company with had lost almost everything we had at that moment. Doesn't seem that dramatic right now, but at the time it was. You know, we had gotten laid off, we had no jobs, yeah. and um, you know, we were just kind of going for it. Um, and then, 
uh, I had brought cooks along um, that c had cooked with me before, and they, they believed, everyone believed in it. And, you know, I had nothing to offer these cooks, man. Like, you know, it was a day rate, and it was like, if we make money, you make money. Yeah. And, um, you know, we had nothing, and, and they trusted me. And, and, then, and then we just, like, and then we kind of, like, you know, just expressed ourselves, man. You know, it was, like, it was like punk rock. You know, we just threw it out there. We opened the doors, and we put this, this food in the taco, and, and we just threw it out, and there was no substitutions. There was no, like, explanation. Um, and it was just this pure, like, like, energy and expression. And then people ate it and then started to, like, they didn't look at us. They started to communicate with each other. They'd be like, oh, shit, this yeah. is crazy. And then, and then Twitter, and then Twitter was the final piece of the puzzle where there was finally a thing, a, a, a vehicle to express that immediate emotion. Um, and Twitter was just coming up at that time, too. So there were all of these elements that were aligned at, at, the, at the right time, just like, you know, the peace and, and LSD movement of the 60s or, you know, whatever. You know, like there was, there was all yeah, of these yeah. things that were aligned. And um, I think all of that was the foundation. The Twitter was the biggest thing because it, it was able to translate that immediate emotion. And then that blew out. And then... Um, uh, what else happened? From there, because the Twitter was attached, we took this old culture and this old history of taco trucks and, uh, and Latino and Korean culture in Los Angeles and kind of just wandering the streets of LA and we took that, which used to be kind of looked at um, in a bad way, even just in the last three yeah, years. You know? yeah. uh, now you call them gourmet food trucks, right? <laughs> Right? Everyone calls them gourmet food. They were just called. They were called roach coaches three years ago. Yeah. No, I wasn't calling them roach coaches. Roach coaches, but the same journalists that are calling them gourmet food trucks were calling them roach coaches. So the thing is, if we just look at that that kind of linear kind of timeline there, what happened was that Twitter kind of somehow put a badge that said, okay, you know, like this is not so scary, you know, like, yeah. this is kind of cool, this is like, we can check this out. Um, and then all of that was just going on at the same time, and, um, and then it just kind of grew and blew yeah. up from there. But I think it really changed Los Angeles. I like to believe it did, you know, in, in a micro way. Um, you know, I don't care, you know, actually, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be bold about it. It did change Los Angeles, you know, because people were not hanging out you know, on Cloverdale and Wilshire in the hundreds before Kogi hit the street and, and talking to each other and saving their place in line for each other and sharing cigarettes and, um, you know, letting them use their phone because their battery ran out, you know. People were not doing that in Los Angeles, yeah. you know what I mean? People were not coming out, you know, on the bridge at Silver Lake from, from Glendale and Eagle Rock, you know, the flips from, from Eagle Rock all the way to you know, the hipsters in, in Silver Lake all the way, you know, to, to the Latino families up in Echo Park and, um, and then all the Koreans coming up from, from Beverly. They were not coming and converging, you know, on the bridge at Silver Lake, you know, before this time. And then, and, then, and then laughing with each other and, you know, hooking up, you know. So, and then now it seems so commonplace for us to just go outside and, say hello and someone can ask you, oh, what do you have in your hand? Oh, sure, I'll tell you what. You know, back, before, you know, back in L.A., I don't know how long y'all been in L.A., but some, there was a point in L.A. where someone approached you and said, so, excuse me, what's that? And you'd be like, what the fuck are you looking for? You know? You know, so it'd be like, so the, the Los Angeles has changed a lot. You know what I mean? So um, I think that's so special. Yeah, well, or, or the, the street culture that had always been there with Latinos, with there. Koreans yeah. when they moved in, has now actually gone from being ignored by a lot of the population mm -hmm. being sort of embraced or at least understood By the whole it. population yeah. now. And, and it, it just showed us how, how similar we are and how we can like things that we may not understand, yeah. you know, and, it, and it, where we can open up. And uh, I always believe in the thing of, like, seeing things aren't what they may seem. You know, so like, um, you know, like, um, so, and then I think bec through this breakthrough, it was like, once people started getting on Twitter, going out to the trucks, they could see that, you know what, it's not that scary, you know, 
It's not that dirty. You know, it's actually really clean. It's actually really delicious, you know? This is really fun. And then people came out in their own neighborhood and they even saw like buildings in their own neighborhood that they walked by every day for three years and be like, whoa, you know, I've never seen this before. And so, um, you know, we're, I think, at a very historic time in Los Angeles on this small little social level, you know, to where we're um, changed a little bit of the dynamic of how we talk to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's great. Why don't we open it up um, and let the audience uh, ask some questions and interact with uh, Roy. Um, and why don't you tell us who you are? We'll go, we'll go first with Joanne. I know who you are. And then yeah. for one Joanne to the other Joanne. But tell us who you are. And uh... no, Well, we have two of them. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Joanne Chong. Yeah. And um, I have two questions for you. One is, where do you see your company going and for the future? And where do you see the food trucks company going in general? Well, um, I talked about that being Korean. Uh, on the business level, man, we're as Korean as we could be, <laughs> man. We're like family run, you know, like cash box, like counter change every day, you know. Open up, close it, and open it up. You know, I'm still running the prep kitchens, and so no vacations, no vacations, all that stuff. But the thing is, um, but we did. We've been doing that for three and a half years now, and this is a re actually a really important question because we are we are going through that metamorphosis. Um, we did everything we could. I was telling David to nurture this thing, to nurture not only Kogi but this culture, the restaurants that we've created. And, um, and it was like a baby, we fed it our milk and we really raised it and now it's time to kick it out of the house and, and send it to college, you know, like, like your parents did to you, you know. And um, so, I don't know, um, I did, we've done everything we can from an underground level to really like cement the, the brand and the culture. So um, my focus now is to, see I'm not really a business minded guy, so my focus is to get the food in as many bellies as I can. So that's my business plan. So, so that means going to like Ann Arbor, Michigan. I went to Ann Arbor, Michigan last year, and I was just like, I was like, man, if I put a Kogi here, like, the Wolverines would go crazy. You know? <laughs> and um, you know, college towns uh, throughout Middle America, East Coast, uh, international. So I think now we're reaching a point where we want to be a little more adult about it, you know, not in a nasty way, but adultish, and, uh, and try to grow the business. But then to do that, you need, um, probably some of you are MBAs or whatever, or business students, um, we need financing. You know, we need, uh, we need a, a stronger infrastructure. Uh, we need capital to be able to build that infrastructure um, because we're still a day-to-day -day business. Even though the, the, the revenue and the, the scope of the business has grown, we're still a day-to-day -day business. And um, so, but then what, sometimes what comes with that, that venture capital or that investment, sometimes the culture doesn't come with it. So we're, we're really looking for the right marriage to where we can find um, someone who, who is dynamic enough to believe in our, our brand, but also help us become almost like a partner to help us grow it. So I would love to see, on a tangible level, I would love to see of, uh, you know, a couple stores here in Orange County, Los Angeles. Also, um, I would love to uh, create maybe like a flagship store in New York, um, and then maybe also go to Asia. Um, I'd like to definitely go to college towns, you know. For me, on a spiritual level, I really think, I don't know how long Kogi's going to last. I can't write that story, but I feel like if I can take Kogi to college towns, it will stay young forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So yeah. it's like, uh, because it's like the fountain of youth, because every four years a new kid will come and experience Kogi. And it will always, it will, it will never grow old, you know, uh, like Edward in Twilight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Joanne over here. Hi, my name is Joanne Park, Hi. and thank you for coming here. Um, it's such a pleasure to hear from you. Um, mine's more of a fun question. If you can try another fusion um, like uh, food, what would it be? Um, I, I can't really answer that directly, but what's happened to me over the last year or so is things have become really intense. I don't want to like 
weird you guys out too much, but my almost like a, a, a freestyle rapper in, this, in, like, in like a circle or a cypher where you're starting to, you can just flow. Like right now what's happening to me is like food is coming, like it's coming so rapidly and I'm like, it, it almost tells me what to cook. Hmm. And um, what I've been feeling right now is like um, uh, somehow blending the Northern African immigration to Paris. Um, so like using French technique and French ingredients and herbs um, but with, with the spirit and the soul of, of the northern North African immigrants up in the northern end, end of Paris. And um, so, uh, you know, and then somehow combining those flavors together, but then with like an L.A., with an L.A. vibe, you know. So that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. Recently, I've done some things uh, with Jam Jamaican and Cuban food uh, at a new place called Sunny Spot. So that was, I guess, maybe... Um, t to give you a solid answer, just, it just happened like two months ago. But uh, Sunny Spot is a place where it was inspired by the Caribbean, but it's not Caribbean food. But, um, but I feel like if I took this food to any neighborhood in any island in the Caribbean, they would be just like giving mad love. You know? So the thing is, um, uh, it's, it's like all of the ingredients of the Caribbean that I translated through my own LA experience, and then it became Sunny Spot. So um, I'm hoping to do the same thing with, with you know, like the working class neighborhoods of Paris. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, on the other end, I really, I really love uh, uh, Indonesian food. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys like Indonesian food. Um, if you don't know it, it's really delicious. You know, a lot of coconut milk and chilies and peanuts and uh, herbs. Um, and um, a lot of steaming, slow cooking, and then um, preserving and eggs. And so um, I would love to con continue to grow within the food of Southeast Asia a lot more. Because it's so vibrant and so pungent and, and, and so powerful. But sometimes it, the, the rhythm of, of, of the food is, is a little bit different than this hemisphere because it's so far down and is in a different place in a different part of the world. So I would love to somehow make it to where it connects a little more, you know, um, and a little less MSG and all that stuff. Because <laughs> like you eat one bowl of pho, you know, it's like you're out <laughs> for the day. Right? Great. Anybody uh, else? Hi, my name's Jeremy. I was wondering if you could talk more about sort of your transition from traditional cuisine to what you do now, because like Le Bernardin is yeah. so like the polar opposite, I feel like, of what Kogi is. Yeah. And I just wonder if that was a gradual shift or if it was something where you just said, wow, this is what I want to do. Well, well the, the shift happened when I lost, I, I, had, I had progressed beyond Le Bernardin as well. And, and my, that was when I was a cook and I was learning. And then and I moved through different jobs, and I even progressed as a professional. You know, I became a man manager and, and, and an executive chef of, like, huge hot hotels, and then eventually the Beverly Hilton, where, um, where they, they just held the Golden Globes, and, you know, there's big opulent things and, and buffets and, and kings of countries and stuff. So, but I lost all that. So there, that transition, to answer the first part, that, that transition happened not by choice. I had nothing else to do. And the other part is where uh, you ever see, it was a horrible movie, but you ever see Ninja Assassin with Rain? You guys, you guys see that movie? You know, like how he's training his whole life, you know, and then, and then like he gets, he, you know, he becomes the bastard of the school and then he has to flee and run over the thing and then, but then he has this huge foundation of training, but then he becomes an assassin and like, um, that's kind of what happened with me. You know, like uh, I had, the, uh, La Bernardin, working at Oriol, working at the Beverly Hilton, and all those things, it really built my foundation so that by the time it, you know, it, it came to the point where I had to make this food, um, you know, all of the foundation was there, so I started playing jazz and just like playing with the flavors. So the approach is still the same. You know, like uh, the expression is different, but the approach is the same. Like the knife cuts are still the same as if I was creating a dish. Um, the, 
the layering of flavor and then um, extracting the aromatics out of garlic and ginger uh, would be the same thing if I was making a reduced emulsion sauce, you know, for like a piece of, you know, ahi tuna or whatever. Um, and so all of those things were the same. It's just now <clears throat> the expression was different. I went back to just being myself. You know, like all of that was like, and you guys are going to go through it where you, you, you try to like, you know, it's not a bad thing, you know, it's a part of life where you try to, you have bosses, you know what I mean? And you have like a career um, where you try to impress people and do well and, you know, overachieve and all those things. Um, but those, and sometimes, um, unless you're very lucky, those aren't really the full expression of yourself. That's your job or that's your school. Um, and Kogi finally became just my true expression of who I was and not like, you know, like, um, you know, like, there's that old saying of like, uh, you know, like just how you really talk in interview talk. You know what I mean? Like, so like, Kogi is just how I talk. Evidently, really there's not much that. difference with you. No, there, but there was. There used to be. There used to be. And that's what I wanted to tell you is that there used to be that distinction and that difference. But now yeah. there's no longer. So. Awesome. Anybody else? Sure. Uh, my name is Josh Park. Um, so I can tell that you have like some kind of special sense or perspective on food. Would you say you had that like your whole life, or did you learn it, or did you like discover it? And if so, like how did you discover it? Yeah, I, I've had it a long time. I mean, um, I, those of you that are Asian here, like uh, you know, like we go back five thousand years, right? Like <laughs> you know, and so um, like. Those that aren't Asian, I'm sure you go back that long. <clears throat> but we, we, we get reminded that we go back 5,000 years, you know. And then so the thing is, like, my whole family tree has been centered around food. Um, you know, uh, we come from, my, my dad's side of the family comes from Chalado, which is known for food, you know, and especially his region is known for food. Um, and, you know, my mom, they immigrated from the north during the war, but... Uh, you know, their area that they came from, their province, was known for food as well. And then within those families and all the, all the lineage, it was always known for food. So then me growing up, I was always surrounded by food. And, um, and so, yeah, it's always been a part of my life. Uh, I, but I never knew that it could be a profession, you know, because I thought it was just a part of my life, you know. Um, yeah, I never knew that, uh, you know, like there was always some sort of distinction. It was almost like walking through a curtain, you know, like you go out and you go out into the real world and then, you know, you know, like you get your game face on and do your, you know, you know, shift your whole like being and then you come home and it's like a whole nother world, right? You know, um, and then uh, it smells different, it feels different, there's different foods everywhere. So that was how it was. That was just like my, my sanctuary. Um, and then but I think when I finally was able to make it a part of my life is when uh, all of those things started to unfold. You, know. um, you mentioned that you went Tell through the... Tell us your the, name first. Oh, Andrew Ju. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you went through the more traditional Korean path where you went through uh, college and law school. Uh -huh. and I was just wondering if you think you learned anything or uh, gained any skills from that or if that was just like yeah. something... <laughs> yeah. Or was it just a waste? <laughs> it's a waste. <laughs> Yeah, education <laughs> is for the birds. Man. You're all wasting um, it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's not just Korean American tradition. That's everybody. You know, everybody kind of going through that. But like, I guess what I want to impress upon, especially a lot of, um, you know, I talk about this a lot. A lot, of, you know, everyone's got their own dramas and their own difficulties growing up. But the the burden we carry as Asians is that uh, you know we're expected to be you know, miracle makers, you know, a lot. And I, I want to encourage, you know, like families and, and like people that are raising kids that it's okay if your kid goes to trade school, you know, like, because like why like suffocate that, that ability or that, that, that beauty? Like uh, you guys are fortunate enough. I mean, you have to realize how fortunate you are. They're, you know, like you're fortunate enough to have gotten into the school and, and study and probably go on to have great jobs. But there's a lot of cats out there that, that are really talented in something and then kind of funneled through 
this traditional educational system, um, when they, they could actually be something really fantastic if they became a mechanic. So if we could break that a little bit, but as far as I go, um, yeah, it helped me a lot. It, it, you know, I can speak to you in, you know, in English, and um, I can put sentences together, and I can add. Um, I can, um, you know, it's given me deductive reasoning, and, and you know, like uh, uh, the ability to, to differentiate things and have a certain moral core, and, um, and you know, to be able to, uh, you know, like communicate with people. You know, so all of those things were necessary because I got friends that can't. They will just sock you in the nose. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but like for me, because of education, I have that same spirit as my friend that would sock you in the nose. But because of education, I can, I can somehow like, you know, like yeah. not sock you in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, but yeah, it, it helped me. Um, it prepared me for culinary school. It prepared me. You know, people don't think that cooking is like a science or, or that it's like, that it uses any like intellect at all. Because um, it's the thing we fight as, as cooks and chefs a lot because all of you guys eat, right? But not all of you guys do surgery on people. So like the thing with food is like everyone thinks like, oh, like I can cook, you know? And then so it kind of like dilutes um, the craft, the craft yeah. a little bit, you know, like, because, you know, my response is, no, you can't cook, yeah. not on this level, yeah. you know, and so, um, so, you know, that, that, it's like, it would be as, as irresponsible as someone reading a 101 textbook on East Asian studies and then saying they can teach the yeah. class, yeah. you know, because they know the broad scopes yeah. of it, um, but, uh, um, yeah, it, it does help me. It helps. It helped me, and it helped me with uh, with culinary school as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I want I want to close by just saying my uh, my seventy year old Korean father. When my, whenever yeah. my parents come down, I was telling you this. Way, we always try and go to a kogi truck. Everybody yeah. loves it. Uh, so it's thank you so much for coming. It's been awesome. Uh, this time we have it recorded, so we'll, uh, as opposed to last time. Uh, oh, yeah. But we hope to have you come here again. So but that's that's folklore. What we did last time. That it is. Lives, it's all it folklore. Lives, it's, it's, in the, it's in the myths of it the Korean Studies Institute. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's been great. Thank you so much. Uh, best of luck with everything, and please join me in uh, thanking Roy for coming here.